know, there seems to be more uh, economic and political interest in deep sea mining than in deep sea agriculture, because uh, that's what. <laughs> and so that's uh, a real looming threat. So just to be clear, um, aside from bottom trawling, where they take a giant, giant, giant fishnet and clear cut everything in the ocean, is there anything else that we're doing to the oceans that's causing the overfishing, the coral reefs dying, the ocean acidification, the microplastics, the garbage patch? Is there anything specific action aside from bottom trawling? And then on land, what actually are we doing wrong with the farming? A lot of people are still thinking like, you know, we farm, what's so bad about that? So what is wrong? What are we doing to the oceans? Bottom trawling is one thing. Is there anything else we're doing that's causing the problems? And when we, in our current food system, what is it that we're doing in the way we're growing that is so destructive? Well, well I think what we're doing with the ocean is we're putting all our crap into the ocean and taking everything that's good out of the ocean. And we're not taking into account, even when you're trying to do something like uh, your renewable energy, you know, they want to build uh, these uh, offshore wind turbines off the uh, coast. And they're not the problem, really, but the pile driving to set these things in, driving 30 meter piles down in there is creating noise pollution at decibel levels, which are destroying sea life. So even when we try to find a, a, an alternative green uh, approach, we un unknowingly or unwittingly are causing more death and destruction because we didn't think it through. Well, when it comes to farming, I mean, we've mentioned this thing about trawling the ocean floor. The when we plow the soil, so so also known as tillage, what what's happening is that there's some of the tiniest creatures on earth live in soil and they're responsible for nutrient cycling. They're communicating with <clears throat> our crops to provide nutrients and different compounds. So you run a plow continually and routinely through the soil and you're upending all of that life as surely as a trawler does that on the floor of the ocean. So that's one problem, Steve. And then, um, so Paul had mentioned, we're putting all this crap into the ocean and not leaving any of the good stuff. We're also putting a lot of things into the soil that uh, are not friendly to soil life. They're also not friendly to us. And so this is just the, the array of um, agrochemicals that have toxic effects or altering effects on, uh, on plants and animals. So again, it's this sort of heavy handed uh, manipulation that we do to the environments that, that we need to survive, whether that's the soil or the ocean. And so we really need to be thinking about lighter touch ways of producing food, whether it's, whether it's the ocean or on land, so that we can leave intact these natural and physical processes that are the whole reason that the soil even functions at all to produce our food. And, and, we, know, and we know how to do that. I mean, the combination of basically going to uh, farming without plowing, so no till farming, but doing it in a way that does not use a lot of agrochemicals by combining it with cover crops and diver diversities of crops and potentially reintegrating where, reintegrating where appropriate animal husbandry into cropping operations as animals can help cycle those nutrients and actually provide a source of, in, of inoculants for some of the life in the soil. There's ways to do that and techniques that can actually be done to offset, um, offset the production of, of more conventional production methods. Um, the other kind of things that are affecting the ocean, some of them result from agriculture, things like all the nitrogen and phosphorus that are contributing to dead zones at the mouths of every major river system around the world um, are directly traceable to how we treat the soil on our farms upstream. These systems are all interconnected, but if we start thinking more about taking care of the life that uh, actually supports us on this planet, whether it's the, the, the krill and the phytoplankton in the oceans or whether it's the microbes in the soil that Anna's just talking about, that's the foundation of our of our aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And if we think as planetary stewards, as we should be with an integrated global society flying around the sun on a giant rock, um, we ought to be thinking about how to take care of those planetary uh, life support systems. And it comes down to supporting the life that is the foundation of it. And that's not what we're doing. Um, in part because we have only really understood those connections in you know the last century, if I'm being generous in terms of the time frame. 
I'd like to add that the two, the largest insult that we that we commit to the ocean every year is the 200 billion tonnes of chemical emissions. And that includes 75 billion tonnes of topsoil, nitrogenous fertiliser, phosphatic fertiliser, you name it. It's all going into the oceans. 760 dead zones are telling us that we are in the process of creating what's known as a Canfield Ocean. That is a stagnant ocean with no oxygen in the water column. That, that actually occurred at, at the, uh, the, the great death of the Permian 200 million years ago. It was the thing that tripped, uh, you know, the fuse on the biggest extinction event in Earth history. Um, and we want to really avoid doing that. So we have to stop that drain of fossil fuels and all the other chemicals that we produce one way or the other, uh, deliberately or unintentionally, end up in the oceans. So these are the things that are, that are killing the sea life. Um, that are poisoning us, all that plastic that's going into the oceans comes back to us, it gets into our brains, it gets into our blood supply, it gets into our babies. You know, the plastic finds its way into fish and it goes up the food chain. You concentrate it up the food chain. Mercury gets concentrated up the food chain. There's a whole lot of horrible things that we put in the ocean that end up in our own mouths. And we really need to be a lot more conscious uh, of, of that, you know, that cycling that is going on at the moment. Now, you know, what is the answer to all of this? The answer is that we have to get the human population back in sync with what the planet can carry in the long run. And according to the science that I've read, that's around about 2 billion people, 2.5 billion people, which is what the population of the Earth was in the year that I was born. OK, so that was a sustainable population, even at modern levels of consumption. Uh, but if you can manage, if the women of the world can lead us to manage that population down, we do have a chance to go forward, you know. But whether, whether, the, whether the population reduces voluntarily or whether we encounter a massive crash as a result of colossal failures of food and other parts of our system is still an open question. At the moment, we're on track for the crash. OK, there is no voluntary movement to reduce human pressure overall. That's why I say we need a plan for human survival and the survival of the planet that supports us. Uh, if we don't have one of those, we're not going to get there. Uh, when are we going to wake up? Sometime in the next 20, 30 years, I believe these disasters will compound enough to constitute a wake-up call. Um, what do you say to the people that say, um, sounds good, but we need all these chemicals to grow enough food to feed the world, and we need to bottom trawl the oceans to get enough fish to feed the world. Uh, for, first, I'd say you've just mentioned one of the biggest myths of the 20th century, um, that we need all those agrochemicals to feed the world. Um, and I recommend both What Your Food Ate and Growing Revolution as sources on some of the data and studies behind the assertions I'm about to make. But the the basic idea is that you, regenerative farming can produce uh, comparable yields of crops after you restore fertility to the soil. So there's a transition period, but the period is actually fairly short in terms of getting yields back up on the farms that I've been around and, and interviewed the farmers on around, around the world, from subsistence farms in Africa to large technologically sophisticated operations in North America. So I think the basic idea that we need modern agriculture in the state that it's in to feed the world um, is really a misnomer. It, it, it flies in the face of a whole lot of ex lived experience of, of, of very experienced regenerative farmers around the world and also data that one can find buried in, in studies. Um, what the challenge is, is I think we need to think very differently about the food system and how we can replace the system that we have now with one that's very effective at growing large amounts of food. The single greatest, um, you know, the greatest ability to produce food per hectare uh, on a farm is from very intensive polycultures with growing multiple, you know, multiple stories of food. Um, but what we've oriented our system to now is growing the largest yields of very particular crops, grains in particular. And they are very, very vulnerable to the effects of climate change in terms of what's going to happen to their yields going forward. So diversifying what we eat could be another big component of that, as was mentioned earlier. But um, I think that we need to be very careful about buying too quickly into what is the conventional wisdom of the day that when we scratch underneath it there's not a lot behind it in terms of support i think you have a, there's plenty of solutions the problem is is that there's a political economic wall that you got to get over and uh 
there's just no, there isn't the courage on the part of politicians to actually take that wall down. So you are all very articulate and um, I very much appreciate you speaking to me, but I assume there you've had an opportunity to be interviewed elsewhere in the world, in, in your life and you've written books and leaders have seen it and scientists and politicians and congressmen and the media. Um, when you say what you said, Paul, about the phytoplankton and uh, oxygen in the ocean dies, everyone dies. And what you're saying, Julian, and what David, you're saying, and Anne, about the food. I mean, these are not mild statements. They're the most serious possible statements. Are you saying that, I mean, other people have heard you say this. So what is the reaction? Do people just say, I'm not going to worry about it? Or like, what? what is, where is this information going? Like, it seems critical. It seems like we have to act 75 years ago would be the latest we should be acting. So what is what response are you getting to people who hear this? Are you saying it very clearly? What, what, what is the response to influential people who hear this information? Well, Steve, I, I wrote my first climate change article in 1976. Um, and I have to say, I'm a bit disappointed in the response. <laughs> but, you know, people are start, starting to get their heads around it and, and things are happening, but not fast enough. I mean, the climate impacts are, are building and building and building, and they're going to get their heads around it, whether they like it or not. It's physics, right? We can't stop it um, in, in, in the short run anyway. Look, there is a worldwide conversation taking place, and we are part of that. We're on Zoom now having this conversation around the damn planet. Human minds are joining up at light speed around the planet. Okay, we have never in our entire history been able to have a conversation with ourselves. We've been little tribes and little countries everywhere, you know, walled off from one another, hating one another, fearing one another. Things like Twitter and, and, you know, Facebook and so forth are actually breaking down those barriers. And the young kids of today don't have the same, you know, prejudices that their elders did. But we are creating a world now where ideas and solutions can travel at the speed of light. And that's what we're doing today. We're exchanging. So we have got this wonderful tool. We're, we're almost, we're joining minds around a planet. We're almost thinking as a species rather than just as individuals. And, and, and I think that's a very wonderful evolutionary moment in, in the story of humanity, that we are able to actually put all these brains together. Now, a lot of those brains are a bit screwy, you know, and, and they, they, they parrot disinformation and conspiracy and things like that. But, you know, you've got to put up with that. Uh, but the truth is, is also getting out there. And, and that's a, a wonderful and a very important thing. And more and more people are participating. I mean, just to take the example of regenerative farming, there's a huge, lively conversation on Twitter about regenerative farming. There are farming groups from all over the world chatting away about better ways to do regen. So that's a wonderful, that, that, that knowledge is not being shared by stodgy old ag departments. It's being shared by farmers talking to one another and talking to consumers who don't want this sickening industrial diet any longer. So there's this kind of conversation going on. And I believe out of that, we can grow the solutions. That, that's my positive take on this thing. Yeah, back, back when I wrote Dirt uh, in 2007, there was no discussion really of soil health and agriculture. It was, a, it was an obscure you know, uh, thing that people didn't really think about. Now you go to farming conferences, it's what everybody wants to talk about. And the whole idea of a regenerative agriculture that can improve soil health as a consequence of intensive agriculture is really catching on in farming communities, I think for possibly for a couple of the simplest of reasons. And one is that farmers are squeezed in the current industrialized agriculture system. Farmers are kind of squeezed between low commodity prices they get for the few crops they do grow and the very high input prices for the nitrogen and the fertilizer and the pesticides that they think they need to grow those crops. They're, they're very squeezed economically and they're looking for ways to cut costs and increase their margins. And regenerative agriculture provides an avenue for aligning economic interests up with ecological interests. And that's why I think we're seeing a catch on fairly rapidly among many farmers. Um, but it also has other attractive things that are making some very large corporations get fairly interested in it. You know, what their programs of regenerative agriculture look like and, and whether they pass muster as truly regenerative may be a whole nother question. Um, but the interest in it is growing where I haven't seen a whole lot of support yet are from governments and politicians. 
um, the thing Paul was pointing to earlier in terms of you know, resistance to basically ideas that will change things. Uh, and if we do move to a more regenerative style of agriculture, there will be winners. And I would argue those are the, the farm, farmers, consumers on the planet. And there will be losers. And those are the people who are selling farmers things like fertilizer today. It's not going to be an easy shift or easy change. Um, but I've seen far more interest among consumers and farmers themselves than I have among our, our political leaders in, in actually leading the way towards a new style of agriculture that would benefit everybody. And to me, that's very disappointing. I've had a few conversations with some fairly prominent politicians who I don't want to name on a, on a Zoom thing, um, but that they're, that issue of short versus long-term um, reaction to crises is a very real one. Um, and they tend to be focused on their next election, not human survivability into the 2200s. We also live in a society where media is controlled, the mainstream media is controlled by uh, corporations, and the politicians are all controlled by corporations. You know, in COP21, uh, Justin Trudeau, as a newly elected prime minister, was the darling of COP21. Everybody, oh man, this guy's way ahead of us. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He went back home and championed the tar sands. He's driving a pipeline through indigenous lands. You know, he's controlling, he wants offshore tankers. I mean, he's become worse than anybody in Canada's history on this. And he was the guy who was going to change it all and really, you know, do something. But, you know, I don't know. I think power corrupts and, and, that, and it shows it each and every time. Well, this is why nations are disintegrating. Nations no longer have the money because all of that's migrated to the global corporations. And, and they no longer have the power that they, to govern that they used to do. I mean, because corporations skip between jurisdictions and things like that. So governments cannot protect their own people against, you know, chemicals and, and things like that because they're coming at them from all directions in the Earth system now. There is a global chemical circulation that no government can regulate against. Um, you know, th th there are things like this. So governments are becoming more and more powerless. And the flip side of this is that they are selecting worse and worse people as, as members of the government. The, the, these bottom feeders who are the current generation of politicians are only in it for themselves. They want to get rich uh, for themselves. They don't give a damn what happens to either the country or the planet or the next generation of humans or their own grandkids. Um, they just want to exploit their position. Uh, so, so, so nations as entities which were invented post-napoleon in, in in europe uh and in america um are now starting to crack up and and we're we're, we're seeing the need to replace them with a with a whole different method of governance worldwide I, I don't want to speculate about what that might be or how it might end up but the nation state is a transitory phase in human development bear that in mind nations are weakening and they're becoming more and more powerless more and more frenetic and 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 uh, you know desperate because they can do nothing about any of these big problems. No nation on earth can do anything about the really big problems by itself. So and they 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 they're not working together. They're doing what they traditionally do, which is compete and fight with one another. They're stupid little things, really. Nations we should never have invented them. Uh, but you know, let us move towards the idea of one people and one planet. We're all in this lifeboat together. If we don't row in the same direction, we go down together. That, that is the point. Now, we're going to see some pretty big warning signals over the next 20 or 30 years. And as I say, we've, we've got the answers. You've been hearing the answers from, from these guys. But we've got the answers. Um, we've just got to start implementing them. And I don't think we should wait, wait for the markets to implement them either because the markets are just greedy, nasty things. <laughs> well, you, you, you even have Coca-Cola sponsoring the climate change conferences now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's it's dominated by by the oil producers and United Arab Emirates. One of the you know people like that are running the next COP, aren't they? It's it's completely yeah. dominated by the fossil fuels lobby. It's ceased to be a conference for the for the people of the world and become one of 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 genocidal idiots. Julian, how could we after this call follow up with you? Get your books, stay in touch with you. Get your newsletter. What what's the best way to support you and stay in touch with you? For our audience. Well, my books are uh, the last three are on Cambridge University Press or Amazon.com. Most of my books are on Amazon. Uh, they're easily available, uh, accessible. Uh, I mean, basically what I'm trying to do is just simply um, provide the science for, first of all, what are the problems? 
and what are the solutions. So I'm trying to give people things that they can do in their own life uh, that will make a difference in order to pick them up. They all feel a bit, people feel a bit depressed about this problem at the moment. So, you know, let's let's look at the simple things that we can do in our own lives, change our diet, you know, reduce our energy consumption, stop traveling, you know, all those sorts of things. And, you know, uh, and you start to feel good about yourself and things start to happen. You start to buy good, healthy, clean food instead of that rubbish that the, the, the corporates produce for you. So, you know, there's a lot that can be done. That's the point I want to, I want to leave. And, and I'm trying to concentrate that across the whole of this problem. You know, because I don't believe it can be solved piecemeal. I don't believe you can solve the food problem on its own. You can't solve the ecological problem on its own. You can't solve, you know, the, even the nuclear problem can't be solved on its own. So they, they, they all have their solutions uh, and those solutions are practical. But we've got to get onto them real fast for the sake of our grandchildren. And that's why I'm in this. I'm, I'm, I'm a grandpa and I'm in this because, you know, I love my grandkids and I want them to have a future on an earth, a habitable earth that can support them. Do you have a newsletter or some way that you, or, or a, a sub stack or some account for people to follow you regularly or just your books? Uh, I have a blog uh, called Surviving C21 and which I, where I sound off about various aspects of this, uh, of this multiple problem. Um, I'm a member of the Council for the Human Future and we're all about publicizing the nature of the problem and also the solutions. That's what we want to do. If anyone wants to support the Council of the Human Future, please get in touch with me. We desperately need some support. Um, but you know, we, we want a, a shared vision of humans going forward. One of the things that we're advocating is an Earth System Treaty. And this is a treaty that addresses all 10 of the big threats. And this is a treaty that's not just signed by countries, because there's a lot of them, this is a treaty that can be signed by anyone on Earth who subscribes to the idea of trying to work towards a habitable planet. Anyone who believes in that can sign this treaty. That's, so we're going to put that to the United Nations, basically, to try to try to get a, an Earth system treaty that addresses all of these problems together, not just one at a time, as we are doing. Julian, thank you very much. Uh, David and Anne, how can we get your books and follow up with you? Do you have a website? What's the best way for people to get more information about what you do and your books, et cetera? Yeah, we, we have a website. It's uh, www.digtogrow.com, D-I-G, the number two, grow.com, as you're seeing up there. And on that site, you can find a description of each of our books. The most recent one, What's Your Food Ate, is really about the connections between how the health of the land, how soil health influences the health of our crops, our livestock, and ourselves. Um, and the other books, Growing Revolution looks at uh, regenerative agriculture, The Hidden Half of Nature looks at um, uh, the role of mi microbiomes, microbial life, and supporting the health of both plants and people, the parallels between what goes on around the roots of a plant and our own gut, and then Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization, which I don't know if we have on our website oh we do it's basically that's the one of the historical backstory of how past societies have ruined their land and the lessons that we can take uh today for why why and how not to repeat that lesson of history um the books are published by uh the dirt's published by university of california press the others are published by ww w. norton out of new york and they can be found pretty much anywhere books are sold your local uh independent bookstore ought to be able to order them from norton of course, Amazon has them, and they're all available on uh, audiobooks as well. If you like to listen to rather than read books, um, but our and if you want to get in touch with us directly, the way to do that is through the contact thing on the web page. That sends Ann and I both an email, and um, we try and get back to people when they do contact us. Or if you want signed books, that kind of thing, that's where you would contact us. Okay, amazing, and thank you. And uh, I appreciate you. You know, you do work that most people don't do. I mean, soil health. It's not there's not that many books on it that I see. So, really appreciate that uh, amount of attention you've put to it, such an important issue. So, thank you, thank you. Uh, Captain Paul. How do we stay in touch with you? How do we support you? How do we donate to your organization? What can we do to help your great work? Well, in 1977, I founded the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, but last year I was ousted from Sea Shepherd uh, in a hostile takeover because I was considered too uh, controversial and uh, too confrontational, and they wanted to change the focus. So I've uh, established the Captain Paul Watson Foundation, and uh, I, re I called it that not to be uh, you know egotistical, but because I figured, well, he took that other organization away from me. They can't take my own name away from me. 
but they're trying to do it anyway. But what we're doing is to carry on the campaigns and the work that we've been doing for the last uh, 50 years, and that is to uh, protect life on the ocean by upholding international conservation law and working with accord in accordance with the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows us to intervene to protect life on the ocean. And uh, it's uh, www. Paul Watson Foundation, and uh, I also have quite a few books that are on there too. If someone donates money to your organization, how is that? How is that helping? What is that doing? It's uh, funding the operation of our first ship, and we'll have more. Uh, we have a 200-foot uh, mm-hmm. vessel, which is leaving uh, at the end of this month to the waters between Iceland and, uh, and uh, Greenland to protect uh, endangered fin whales. They want to kill them. It's illegal. It's a violation of the moratorium and commercial whaling, and so we're going to <clears throat> intervene to protect them. So you're saying instead of people getting their own boat, driving all the way to Iceland and fighting uh, people who are killing the fish, you'll do it for them. And all you're asking is for a very small donation of $25 to $200, ideally a month. Well, actually, the most important thing is people become monthly donors because that gives us security that we that we need. That could be $5 or $10. It doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, and also we're gearing up to the Japanese they're going to return to the Southern Ocean to uh, illegally kill whales again in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. And uh, I intend to be down there if, uh, to meet them if they do. And we're also doing campaigns to stop super trawlers and uh, to stop the killing of whales in Norway and the Faroe Islands and, and uh, in Japan. So there's a lot to do. And, um, at the, and also at the same time to focus attention on uh, what's happening in our ocean. The book I'm most proud of is that uh, recently I published uh, We Are the Ocean. It's a children's book because I, I think it's more important to get books to children than, uh, than uh, to adults in many ways. Okay, so if we could unmute the mic, we have three hero, four heroes here and I'd like to thank them for what they do and support them going forward. So very great thanks for coming on and all the work you are all doing and such important issues. And I want to give everyone else a chance to thank you as well. Thank you. 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 Thank